Hello everyone, Elvis here, and I'm back with a new paper explainer. This one is DeepSeq Coder version 2, which was released today by DeepSeq AI. And there's also a code link here to the different models that they released. This paper is basically presenting a model which they claim to be the best open code and math model out there available. And this model is really great at math coding and also natural language tasks. And so you will see how it comes close also to models like GPT-4, which are closed source models. Um, and so I think this particular model closes the cap in terms of performance with these closed source and also the existing open source models that exist today, like Lama Tree. I'm gonna go through a few things that stood out from this paper. Uh, this DeepSea Coder version two is an open source mixture of exports code language model that achieves performance comparable to GPT-4 Turbo in code specific tasks. Obviously they did a lot of comparisons on code related tasks. So we're gonna go through each one of these. And there's also like math reasoning and natural language understanding general capabilities as well. So they did some comparison there as well. So. But this model specifically is about code generation. And they say that it's further pre-trained from an intermediate checkpoint. So they're using DeepSeq version two as their starting checkpoint with an additional six trillion tokens. So overall it's like 10 point something trillion tokens, but because they are doing this additional pre-training, um, they all put together an additional six trillion tokens. And this one also expands and supports more languages, more programming languages. So it goes from 86 to 338 and also extending context from 16K to 128K to support even more complex tasks as well. And again, this is about code generation. In code generation, it's really important to have that extended context length and at the same time, making sure that the performance is great too. So we're gonna look at results in a bit, but those are kind of the main highlights of this particular paper. And they claim here off the bat that they achieve superior performance compared to closed source models such as GPT-4 Turbo, Cloud3 Opus, and Gemini 1.5 Pro in coding and math benchmarks. Now keep in mind, these are general purpose models. These providers also compare with these general purpose models because these are some of the models that a lot of companies and researchers and even developers are experimenting with, regardless if it's coding or math or other knowledge intensive tasks. You can see from the results here, so this is sort of the summary of the results on the different math and code benchmarks. So I believe this is more like average. And so you can see here, for instance, in human eval, that you have 90.2 compared to GPT-4 Turbo 0409. 88.2, so you can see that's a nice improvement there. Similarly, they also compared on the GSM 8K, so GSM 8K and MAT, these are more MAT related benchmarks. Now this human eval and MVPP plus, those are more coding related benchmarks, but you can see in four of these benchmarks that their model outperforms all the rest of the ones that were compared. With the exception of this one right here, which is Cloud3 Opus, which is also a very good model. You can see here that Cloud3 Opus achieved 95.0 compared to 94.9. Very, very small difference, but you can see that this model is also very powerful. And we have other code related tasks here. Now these ones are more complex benchmarks. We're gonna discuss them as we go through the different results. And you can see that the results are not so great, right? As compared to these ones on these complex benchmarks. You know, there are many reasons they explain as to why that is the case. And keep in mind that they are proposing two models here, right? So there is a 16 billion parameter model, and there's also one with more than 200 billion parameters. And these are just some details on how they created the, their data set. Um, you can see that for Deep Sea Coder v, V2, uh, it's composed of 60% source code, 10% math corpus, and 30% natural language corpus. Overall, the source code consists of 1,170 billion code-related tokens sourced from both GitHub and Common Crawl. So that would encompass the entire dataset that was used for continuing training these DeepSeeker Coder V2 model. And they mentioned here that to accommodate 
code, inputs, and enhance applicability across various programming scenarios. They extend the context length from 16K to 128K tokens. In the alignment phase, now they have their base models, which they're also offering. But in the alignment phase, they also construct an instruction tuning dataset that includes code and mat data from DeepSeq Coder, right? So we have this DeepSeq Coder model as well and DeepSeq Mat that was used. So that's what they're using for that instruction training dataset. And they use group relative policy optimization, which is more about reinforcement learning in that phase. Obviously, when we want to instruction tune these models or we want to align them, we are using reinforcement learning a lot. And so to make sure that we align with the behaviors that humans prefer, right? To make this model as useful as possible. Now, something they call out in this paper here, as I summarize what this paper contributes, is the use of fill in the middle approach, which is a way to train these models to be able to also, you know, do this kind of infilling of code when you're generating code. So with these models, what you can do is you can provide it a prefix and suffix, and then you have that kind of middle component, which the model is able to predict as well and generate content for that. Those are really good for like code tools that you may use today. Like if you have, for instance, using a code generation tool, right? With an IDE, for instance, um, when you ask the model, you can provide the prefix and a suffix, and the model can auto-generate code in the middle, right? So that's very useful for those type of tools. Again, they are proposing two big models here. This is a 16B and also a 230C, specifically billion parameter models. So these are the two that are introduced here, and they're using the mixture of exports framework, which is no surprise now. And they also have an activation parameters of only 2.4 for the first model, this one, and then 21 billion for this model, right? And that's really important to make sure that we have efficient inferencing, and we have these models that can be used in the real world. At the end of the day, if it's a slow model, it's really hard to apply you know, in a production setting. So that's really important to get right. So here is a summary of the evaluations and metrics. You can go through each one of them, but what we're gonna do in this video, we're gonna go through each one of them and I'll give you my takes and a summary of all the things that really stood out from the results that they report. Uh, they talk about data collection. I won't go through this too much, um, but again, it consists of 60% source code, 10% math corpus, and 30% natural language corpus because they do want to focus on code generation mostly, but they also want to test whether this model can do math as well and can perform general natural language uh, tasks as well. So that's something that they're testing with these models because when you're testing these models, maybe you know, you're, not, you're not always going to use it in the context of code generation, but it may be in the context of code generation plus additional instructions and many other types of general tasks that you may be able to perform, right? Like for instance, if you are using ChatGPT and you're using for educational purpose, you may want to generate also like natural language, like that could help in an education sense and be able to generate code as well. So it really depends on the type of application. So there is some code data filtering approach that they use here. Uh, you can read more about it. As I said, I won't go through all the details. That's something that you can read on your own. But the more important one is that the new code corpus that they're using consists of 1,170 billion code-related tokens sourced from both GitHub and Common Crawl. So they're doing a lot of filtering as well, and they explain all their filtering process and so on. So this is really good because this is an open source model. So it's good that we know what's the pipeline that was used for collecting the data and making sure it's of high quality, right? So there are lots of lessons that they mention here. So it's good to check that out as well. They did an ablation study for testing the quality of code purpose here. So what they wanted to do, they actually trained a small model and they just wanted to see if the collection of this new data set, this new data set uh, was effective and could allow the model to learn on these different tasks. And they did that test here and they noticed that it indeed it does. And you can see here when they use like two trillion tokens, um, how it's improving the performance compared to the base model that they were using here, which is a deep sea coder 1 billion. So from there, they kind of scaled this, right? And they were focusing on first here in the paper, deep sea coder version two, the 16 billion model for which there are a lot of experimental results that they report. Um, and they use the next token prediction and fill in middle FIM 
right, as the objectives for this particular model. And for the next model, which is a 236, the bigger one, they only utilize the next token prediction objective. I won't go through the model architecture as well, but you can check it out. They are inspired by DeepSeq version 2, which is one of the general purpose models that they released recently. Um, and basically they build from that with a couple of changes, I guess, to some of the parameters and maybe normalization techniques that they were using in the second stage. They train the model for an additional 1,000 steps, employing a sequence length of 128K and a batch size of 288 sequences. Now, I like that they're transparent about these little experiments that they run and also all the details behind that. Even the batch size matters, right? If you really wanted to replicate what or reproduce what they have done and the experiments, it's all there to do. So they're using the needle in a haystack, which is a popular benchmark for measuring or evaluating uh, recall performance. It's kind of a simple evaluation benchmark just to test how these models are performing, especially with long context models, uh, how good they are at recalling information. Um, you know, as you extend those contexts and something you don't want to happen with these models is that you don't want them to, you know, maybe miss it or ignore information. So that's something that they wanted to test, which in this case, it looks like this model was okay, even for long context. Now for the alignment part, now they have done supervised fine tuning combined with reinforcement learning. So they mentioned here that they constructed instruction tuning data set mixed with code and math data. They collect 20K code related instruction data and 30K math related data from DeepSeq Coder and DeepSeq Math. Now all that work that they have done in the past, they're sort of using back again here with this version two model. And they use an instruction data set of 300 million tokens. So that's kind of the total that they're using. And again, they specify the details and the different initial rates and so on that they're using for this supervised fine tuning step. They mentioned a few details here for the reinforcement learning phase. And they mentioned here that it's important technique to fully simulate the capabilities of DC Coder version two, which has proven to be quite effective. Now, this is not surprising. There are a lot of different models that are leveraging RL, so it's not surprising that they are also leveraging it for this really large model as well. They mention here with the prompts that they spent some effort like collecting the prompts right related to code and math from various sources, and each code prompt comes with corresponding test cases. After filtering the prompts, there are approximately 4K data in total. Now this step here mentions the preference data collection. So they have the mathematics preference data that they collected and they do that using the ground truth labels. And this is again to train this reward model, which is an important part of this whole RL training process. For the code preference data, they do mention something here that the reward model was used to provide RL training signal instead of the raw compiler signal. You can see from the performances that they report here on the lead code, just using supervised fine tuning model, that's the green. And, and again, this is pass at one, which is common with these cogeneration models. And the reward model signal, you can see how it's going up here as it goes through the different steps of training. And you can also compare it with the blue, which is just using the compiler signal, which is a, feels a bit noisy, as I mentioned. Um, sometimes even underperforming, just using supervised fine tune model. So again, you can see from this particular results that it made sense to use the reward model signal. Here is a summary of the experimental results, and these would include tasks such as coding, mathematics, and general natural language, as I mentioned before. These are the models that they are going to compare. It. So there are a couple of open source models, some dedicated models for code generation. There is also like the general language models that they compared with, right? The Llama tree, the GPT-4, Cloud Tree Opus, and Gemini 1.5 Pro as well. So for code generation, these are the main results, and I'll just kind of quickly summarize them here. So you can see the one that I've highlighted in red is from their models, and they have the lighting struct, which is a smaller model. Again, the 16 billion and the 236 billion is the one that gives the best results uh, for all the open source models. But you can see how it also compares well with these other closed source models like GPT-4.0 and GPT-4 Turbo. Uh, something here that's interesting, you can see from the performance here with all the different languages, and also you have the average here. So from the average, we can see that this model 
uh, got 65.3 and then the GPT-40 got 76.4. So apparently on this particular benchmark, the human eval and MBBP, this particular model is the best performing model, which is GPT-40, which is again today one of the best models that exist today. But you can see that performance, right? Really closing in. So it's really great to see this because what we want as well is we want this model to be able to perform great across all the languages as well. Under that, we have other tasks as well, such as competitive programming, which I would consider some of the more harder tasks as well because they're, uh, they're assessing different things, right? They are obviously harder benchmarks. And so you can see how these models perform as well. So they have different uh, problems like easy, medium, hard, and they're nicely categorized and then overall here. So overall, the DS Coder version two instruct model, the biggest one here, uh, this is the performance on overall. So they get 43.4, which is compares nicely with the 4.0, but the GPT-4 Turbo seems to get better results. So this also is very interesting that we have GPT-4 Turbo Right, this particular checkpoint or performing GPT-4.0, oh, I would expect the other way around. And they also compare USACO, it's a benchmark containing 307 problems on the USA Computing Olympiad. Uh, again, very hard, I would say, task for a model. You can see GPT-4.0 oh, getting 18.8%, and you can see also how DS Coder perform here with 12.1%. I would say overall, it's very competitive on this particular benchmark. And obviously there is a more significant gap between these two, but I would say this is a more complex task. These are more code generation tasks, repository level code completion evaluation. So we can see the results here. It is behind CodeStraw, which is the new code model from Mistral, but a lot faster for code completion. So there's also these trade-offs that we want to pay attention to. Um, again, they test on different context lens, and you can see that this particular model is a lot stronger compared to them. But keep in mind, again, with the inference, right? The inference speed here. This is a 2.4 billion parameter, which is active parameters, which is also great. Fill in the middle code completion, as I mentioned, really important as well for code completion tools, right? If you want to build those with these type of models, you can see how this one performs here. Their model, this one is a light-based model. You see how it performs. This is the mean, you see 86.4%. And you can see how it did with the individual different languages that were performed, right? And so again, very performant on different languages but you can see how it competes and outperforms really the other open source models that were reported here. Next, we have code fixing. This involves even more complex tasks because I think this is like doing evaluation on tasks where we have a complete code base, right? Where we may have bugs and things like that that we need to fix or the model needs to fix. You can see how it performs here, GPT-4, oh, no surprise, is the most competitive model on this particular task. On the three different benchmarks here, you can see the performances from GPT-4, oh. It's the strongest performance here on this one, uh, but you can also see that the model that they are proposing is very close and in cases, in some cases, even outperforms, right, the GPT-4 model. So you can see for Aether, for instance, this model outperforms GPT-4, right? So Aether, let's take a look at what it is. So Aether is this code editing benchmark that evaluates the LLM's ability to modify Python source files completing 133 distinct coding tasks. So it's not quite clear why this is the case, but it seems this model is really strong on this particular benchmark. Uh, but you also have, obviously here, you have some gap between GPT-4.0, but I think this is an open source model and it's a much smaller model as well. So they do some evaluation on code understanding and reasoning. So again, this one involves understanding of code and there's like this benchmark that has 800 Python functions, peer corresponding input output examples. So this one eval I requires the LLM to predict the output based on the given input. And this one eval O where the model must predict the input from the known output, right? So it's the other way around. The challenge here, is that the model has to be able to understand and reason through Python code in both forward and reverse directions. GPT-4 oh, is the best performing model, again, on these tasks. So there is obviously a huge gap with this one, but overall, they're all performing all the other open source models like CoStral and Lemma Tree Instruct. For mathematical reasoning, 
There are results that were also presented here. And again, these are the instruct models that they use, the light one and the uh, bigger one. And so you can see for GSM 8K, GPT-4 again is the best model, but you can see how the gap closes, right? So it's 94.9 and then for MAT, 75.7, 70. So it's very consistent. It's good to see these results. And even for this one here, and this is the American Invitational Mathematics Examination, again, more MAT related, it's four out of 30. Even these models like GPT-4.0 and GPT-4 Turbo struggle with this particular task. So this must be a very difficult task for these models. So very competitive, right? Even competitive with GPT-4.0. And so... I think it's great to see this, that we have a model that is really good at code and maths. And I think the combination of those capabilities can really give you a super powerful model, which seems to be the case here. So they're also testing for general natural language capabilities. You can see that they compare with their previous models. So they're comparing Coder V2 with the standard V2 model that they had previously introduced. You can see how it does outperform that other model by a lot in a lot of cases. So this one is just the light model and this one is the bigger 236 billion model. So you can see how it compares with the performance of the other original model. Um, nothing really stands out for me here. They are reporting that DeepSeq Coder V2 Lite instruct files behind in knowledge intensive benchmarks like Trivia QA primarily due to the relatively smaller amount of web data used during retraining. So you can see here the performance, right? There's a significant gap in performance with some of these knowledge intensive tasks. Again, because we are training a model on code generation specifically, still performing really nicely, but it's not as great as the other general purpose models, which is the one that they're comparing with here. So that's it for this overview. Hopefully you know, it was inspiring for you. You learned something about this work. Um, my takeaway from this paper is the focus on creating these models, right? These code generation models that are really powerful can allow you to do all sorts of complex code generation tasks. I'm really interested to see what a version tree may look like. But the theme here is the importance of high quality data, right? Extending that context light so to support even more complex code generation tasks. And obviously the results are amazing. They compare well with GPT-4 Turbo. So this is a custom model, right? Remember that these other models are general purpose models. So it's not so surprising to see it. It's great to see it though, to see that we are closing the gap between these general purpose models that can do a lot of code generation tasks and these customized models, right? That do really good code generation. The innovation here is the collection of those data sets. And they shared a lot about their pipelines and how they filter out data. So pay close attention to that section. Take a look at that if you want to learn more about how they came to this point. And something that stood out here in the last paragraph here of the conclusion. So they say there's still a significant gap in instruction following capabilities compared to current state-of-the-art models like GPT-4 Turbo. This gap leads to poor performance in complex scenarios and tasks such as those in the SWE bench, right? We, we spoke about those benchmarks, how hard they are, right? The, the scenarios are much harder. It's not just about generating a function. It's, it's way more than that. And so therefore, we believe that a code model needs not only strong coding abilities, but also exceptional instruction following capabilities to handle real world complex programming scenarios. So they emphasize here that they'll be focusing more on improving the model's instruction following capabilities to better handle real world complex programming scenarios and enhance the productivity of the development process. Now, I'm very curious as a researcher, how they're gonna achieve this if they're just gonna be focusing on collecting better and better and better data and filtering to make sure that they have the best data, right? That could represent and could allow us to train a bigger model with all these capabilities, or they're gonna combine it with like 
tool usage or some other code interpreter like what GPT-4 does today. So that's going to be interesting to see and watch. I do think they are onto something here. Congrats to the team on the paper. I really appreciated all the different details that they shared. These are open source models. You can find them on their GitHub, right? The initial link here that was shared in the abstract for all the different details and different pipelines that were used to train this model. I'll leave the link to the paper in the description but that'll be it for this video and thank you all again for supporting the channel and see you in the next one